Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. How are you? <laughs> I love why I love that you you giggle every time we get on the on the on the Zoom. Because it's so funny that we have this huge conversation before we we start recording, and then we have to come on and say hello. And then yeah. Um, yeah, it's true. Hello, anybody watching uh, this evening. Speaking of seeing picture perfect, the choices are not mine, but Bill has. <laughs> <laughs> Bill has selected a series of images. I guess we could just loosely call um, photorealism. Yeah. Well, I I just thought it was the. I guess there are there are two directions to go with this. One, uh, it's the next step from the minimalism that we were discussing for the last two weeks. Um. And also uh, Chuck Close, famous photorealistic painter, died recently. Yeah. So uh, I thought that it was uh, a decent time to discuss this kind of stuff. Yeah, so Chuck Close, the at least at one time, highly esteemed American photorealist, uh, passed away on the 21st, so earlier this week, August 2021. Uh, now, this is a big painting. Do you do you have the do you happen to have the uh, the size somewhere? I don't. Annoyingly, I've written down the sizes of all the others, but this one. What I can attest to is that it is. Just giant. trying to pull it up. Go ahead. It is a giant. It's 240 or 274 inches oh i'm sorry 108 inches by 84 inches hmm. so two 2.7 meters by a little over two meters so yeah. this is a big painting it is um, and when you stand in front of it it has a curious effect i mean you can attest to that i know it's eerie hmm, why why is it eerie i mean it's a little bit like wait who's the guy who makes the big babies and all that stuff Ron the Rick. sculptures there you go. It, it's a little bit of, of that. It's a little bit of, do you ever go, have you been to Sequoia trees? Have you been near Sequoia trees uh, out in the American West? No. Um, you know, these are trees that are so big that you feel like they've been Photoshopped in front of your eyes. You know, it's like that tree can't actually be that big. And you go up and you touch it and you think this tree is so big that it's like, you know, 50 60 feet around it's like this is, doesn't make any sense it just goes up into the sky and you think this thing can't actually be that big and it kind of messes with your perception so in that way you know a painting like this you go and you see and it looks like you know from more than six feet away it's just a giant blown up photograph of this guy mm. um of course the reality is is that it's painted because this was you know, in the time before Chuck Close's, what does he call it? The event? Is that what he called it? His, uh, where he ended up in a wheelchair? Yeah, he had the... Um, kind of a stroke, right? Collusion of the arterial yeah. artery yep. in 1988. And he had to yep. adapt his entire working practice. I mean, I'm sure everybody looking can appreciate that. Um, and again, remembering the scale of, of this painting, it's vast. That's that yeah. this would involve a whole lot of physical manipulation of very controlled movement. Yeah, and I mean, you can you can type in Chuck Close into YouTube and you can actually watch him working um, pre the event, but you can also then see how later he adapted so that he would have a paintbrush that was actually taped to his, his hand mm -hmm. in his, um, his later work. And also, of course, the later work has you know, visible marks. There are lots of abstract shapes and more like a kind of um, almost collage. Collage, yeah. So, it, but what's interesting though is that each each little element of the later work, which we can talk about it some other day, because it's actually also really neat in some ways. That kind of is is that they're almost optical illusions, right? It's like you step back and it feels like it's this complicated image and then you go up close and it's just swirls of paint of different colors sitting on top of each other and you're just thinking, in in a, in a in a grid and you're just like that's amazing that he was able to mix paint in that way so that 
you could get the idea of the color, even though it's mixes of color and your eye does merging of color and all of that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, those kind of uh, tricks are, it, you know, that's, that's handed down. That's a, there's a long lineage of that in art history, isn't there? From sure. Darrow and Stura, any of the, the pointillists. Yep. But you mentioned the work, the grid there, you know, this, this work was, I mean, meticulously gridded out before he would begin painting. Um, yep. it's, there's nothing accidental in this painting. Every single yep. detail is so carefully considered. What I'm interested in with this though, is though the process is so carefully considered, I'm very yep. keen to know what you think about um, whether the idea, the concept yep. is carefully considered. Yeah, obviously the craft is exceptional. Mm. Um, does it mean anything? You know, it's sort of a, uh, if, if, if minimalism was all about the meaning and very little about, and less about the craft, and this is all craft and arguable meaning, it's sort of the, they're opposites of each other in a lot of ways. Um, I was talking to a friend earlier who knew that we would be speaking about this this evening and she was asking me about, you know, why, why was, why did photorealism happen? Yeah. Um, you know, without even going to, uh, an art history book and trying to trace its kind of the inceptive moment of it. Of course, we all know that, you know, what the birth of photography impacted painting, painting allowed yep. itself to become expressive and abstract by the yeah. 19th century. And, and, and not for nothing, but in the 19th century, even stuff that was very figurative took cues from photography in a lot of ways with elements entering the side of the frame and things like that, that people wouldn't have generally done if they were painting from their mind. But it's the kind of stuff they saw in photographs that they would end up bringing to photographs even before things became more abstract or, or, or yeah, impressionistic. I mean, photorealism really is a, is a giant reaction. Sure. To um, a, a century in which painting had become perhaps process driven in the opposite way and where technical skill of a particular kind had been devalued actually. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's rather it's, been uh, mocked. And you think about somebody as powerful in art and art history uh, as Picasso, um, moving away from representational art himself and becoming through all his various styles, particularly cubism, a, a leader of, you know, any kind of abstraction that would follow within the 20th century. I think people got sick, Chuck Close got sick of there not being a, a level of attention to practical process detail. Yeah, I mean, if you take, if you take abstraction and minimalism and you take them to their nth degree, and I, I think that I've said a couple of times in the last couple of episodes is sort of, cul-de-sac that this leaves you it's like at a certain point you can't get any more it's it's like a, a spinal tap you know how much more black could this be the answer is none none more black and it's like well you know this but, is just snapping back in the other direction has just the same problems in some I, ways i would like to say though that um chuck close for all his movement away from abstraction um, as we might think of it in, in mid 20th century and for all this need for meticulousness and precision. Um, one of the most defining moments of his young life was apparently going and seeing uh, an art gallery with his mum in Seattle where he encountered age 14 a uh, Jackson Pollock painting mm -hmm. and he had a kind of reaction to the painting uh, and I've written it down. He said he was chasing an experience of seeing Jackson Pollock's drips ever since seeing that work. So there was something experiential in paint. For yeah. And this, and in some ways for him, maybe this is how he expressed himself in the, trying to reach the same goal. Yeah, I, 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 but I just find it so strange that um, someone like Close would have been so impacted by Pollock yeah. Um, but there are a lot of examples of that. One is like on the edge of my brain that I can't quite pull in, but if it comes to me, I'll, I'll remember it. But where a certain person, you know, it's like uh, you, end, you end up finding out that, you know, Aaron Copeland loved the Beatles or something. And you're like, really? Well, you know, 
just these like weird things that you would never expect that are so sort of on the opposite ends of things, but there, there's a respect in both ways. It's also interesting because not only has Chuck Close uh, represented this photograph of, of Mark and including the out of focus areas being a little bit, you know, smeary and, and, you know, the bokeh of all of that looking like optical bokeh, but also it also does a really good representation of like 70s film color, you yeah. know, like this looks like a photograph from the 1970s, even in the, the skin tone, which if you took this picture with a modern camera, modern digital camera, it wouldn't look the same way. Even if you, you know, dress somebody up this way, it's, it's like they're there. It's so in some ways it's like this in, in amber, like um, encapsulated version of 1970s history in a painting of a photograph of a, what, you know, it's like this, it's, 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 a riddle inside of enigma, you know, well, the fact I mean, that you can that, see the umbrella in the shot and everything too. It's does amazing. That mean, does that mean that we've, or I have missed a trick really in not giving this full credit in terms of actually having so much more meaning than I can even begin to imagine that there's something, um, well, you just described this almost like Russian doll effect of, yeah. of possibility of meaning. Um, I, I, you know, for me, I like this work and we're going to show a few more. Um, my feeling about photorealism is that I have, I have, I have a weak spot for what I call uh, competence porn. <laughs> it's like, I love when somebody does something incredibly well and I can look at it and just think, oh my God, how does that person do that? So when I look at photorealism as somebody who can't draw, like literally draw stick figures, I look at this and I just think, I don't even know how somebody imagines doing this. I mean, Chuck Close also famously says that he was face blind, right? And that that may have given him some advantage because he just looks at faces like objects. He doesn't recognize them. He doesn't think of them as faces. It's just shapes and tones and, you know, all the rest of it to him. Well, that's why um, um, watching him work is so fascinating, uh, particularly when the canvas is later when he was immobilized rotating yeah he would rotate and actually in teaching i know that one of the easiest ways to help young people who are stuck with a particular shape or form turn it upside down turn it upside down and and then to see it so that the brain isn't registering what it thinks it knows yep because that knowledge is the thing that's blocking the real seeing um do you know if, if Close ever discussed whether had the event not happened, had, had, he, had he not been forced into changing his methodology if he was planning on it anyway, or if that was a sort of, you know, happy accident as it were, to changing the way he does things? But, you know, I just wonder, it's like, because in some ways he took what was, you know, on the edge of hyper-realism, mm. this stuff, and then went back into a strange abstraction by necessity, I guess, hmm. arguably. And, and so it's, it's just interesting that I wonder if he was like, well, I, I don't have the acumen to do that other thing anymore. So I have to find some other way to express myself. So I'm going to come up with, you know, playing with grids, which are just as constrained in a lot of ways as a projection would be creating this. It's just a different, it's, I mean, the grid is still there and I'm sure he used computers breaking up a photograph to even color the grid out and figure out what he was going to do and had a plan. I mean, you can see the papers next to him when he does stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it is, I, I, you know, I like it because I like this stuff because it's really impressive when you see it in person. Yes. I think it's, I think it's impressive just because I'm like, some person actually did this, mm -hmm. but it does make me wonder because, okay, there are people now like, uh, well, we'll get to it after. Uh, can we go to the next uh, slide? Uh, I just want to remind everybody, these are Bill's choices. I would also like to just mention that even though these are Bill's choices, he still sent them to me and asked me to put together the slideshow. So I've, well, done, you, I've done all the hard work. Excuse me. I think that you're the one who's very particular about your PowerPoint <laughs> slide design, even though you use, you know, the standard nominal font no, in I, the whole thing. 
No, I don't. What do you use? Century school book. Century school book. Of course you do, TJ. <laughs> um, right. So Nathan. Now, right. A lot of people, this is now a, a much more modern version of this uh, being from, you know, a handful of years ago. Um, and actually the, 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 the other two that we're showing are actually still modern versions of it. It's interesting that you have somebody like Chuck Close that uses a face. And then there's a lot of people like Nathan and I think maybe the next guy, I forget what order we put them in, um, who basically have chosen man-made structures as the origins of what they're doing. But what I love about this image is not only just the insanity of actually trying to paint this, like, I don't even know, where do you start? And actually you can go on his website and look at all of the drawings that he's made. Yeah. And they're um, amazing. Hundreds of drawings. Uh, I think this particular painting, Chicago in the rain, there were, there were a hundred drawings. Yep. Um, so he doesn't use any kind of mechanical device to make these. It's entirely his own hand, so to speak, that constructs these, um, these paintings. Uh, they're, they're not as big as the Chuck Close paintings, but they're still, you know, 50 by 72 inches, this painting. Yeah. But I mean, my thing about it is that there's still lens optical curvature in the image. Yes. Yeah, so I think what's it's nuts. so great is that um, through all these drawings that he makes, and there's a description that, you know, they're, you know, he's working really from what might appear to be architectural blueprints. Yep. Though he's not using any mechanical device to record or then to, to create the painting, the fact is, is that what he's doing manually is very similar to what one would do on, on any of the kind of computer software that would enable especially architects or town planners to manipulate space to get the best fit or alignment yep. and you know, he, he describes his work as only in some ways resembling the world we live in. Yeah. So this appears to be very precise. And of course it is, and it is contemporary realism. Uh, yet we have this, as you say, the kind of curvature. For somebody who's obsessed with perspective, what that kind of curvature suggests is that they're playing with space that they actively construct they're playing with space, the construction. Yeah. They're not just flattening out. Uh, this is where this work to me has a lot more kind of mileage than the close stuff. We, I mean, you did mention about the fact that obviously Close's work is portraiture and sure. you have a face. There's something automatic with our human recognition that can draw us in very powerfully. And when we see this kind of scene, which in so many ways is a passive scene, uh, we might not feel the same deep connection unless we happen to know this particular part of Chicago or unless we know that that's like our auntie with the yellow umbrella or something. But the longer one spends with this painting, I think the more one can really tell that we've entered, we've entered a world. And yeah, Nathan's mind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm surprised that you find as much in this as you're claiming. I, I was guessing that you would be not dismissive, but but like you would find these cold. I think this is really, really extraordinary. Again, you did, you know, we said before there's like a Russian doll element with Chuck Close's work. I think there is with this too. I think yeah. reading about Nathan Walsh's um, sense of process yeah doing and why he's doing it is so interesting and I don't do you think somebody like this has to be a little savant like in order to do this I mean there's like a strange disconnection from reality or hyper connection to reality like there's somebody like you or I couldn't do this you know this takes a certain kind of brain yep and uh, you know yes I think there's an element of recording uh, faithfully yeah but there's also an element of um, kind of compulsion to record and retain mm, but again because the actual representation 
of this reality is not necessarily how the eye would see it if one were to experience it that tells me that this has been taken as you say into Nathan Walsh's mind into his world and somehow okay. transmogrified or changed to meet us it's also interesting in this case that you know in in Chuck's I pointed out the the out of focus areas and that kind of stuff like there's a it's literally blending a photographic thing onto on, into paint where this one, the depth of fields goes all the way out to the distance, as far as I can tell from any images I've seen of his, hmm. that, you know, there's things are sharp all the way out. You know, um, if I, if I saw this painting on a wall somewhere, I actually probably would be quite dismissive of it. I think that without that, having read anything, if I didn't know, now this, yeah. is where, this is where knowledge has granted me an enormous privilege in looking. Mm, I, I know that I quite naturally would gravitate to the portrait more. Yep. But spending longer with this one really pays the dividend, I guess. There is an interesting thing that happens, though, in images like this and with work like Walsh's and others where you, if you saw 10 of their pieces, yeah, a couple of them might speak to you more than the others, but it's not that they're a one trick pony because it's a hell of a trick. Mm -hmm. But most people who do this kind of work just do this kind of work. And it's like, oh, this is just another scene from another city in another place that looks very similar. You know what I mean? It has a similar thing because ultimately what you're going for is a reproduction of reality. So it's not like there's... You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I find it fascinating, but I could see somebody being in and just like, okay, and, yes, you know. And, and that's why I think the best question to ask about this work is why? Why has Nathan Walsh made this painting? I think because he can. Just because he can. You know, why has Chuck Close made this painting? I mean, you and I were discussing before we started recording, who the hell is Mark? I right. mean, I'm sure somebody somewhere will know, and I'm sure there's tons of stuff written about Mark, but I, I don't know. Yeah. But do I feel like I know Mark? And was that indeed the intention of Chuck Close? Very yeah. often, even though we're in this extraordinarily intimate seeming uh, proximity to this face, there's nothing intimate about it, I don't find. So although it's yeah. stunning and it's engaging and it draws you in and you want to go and look at it, you approach it on the wall, yeah, nothing succeeds like scale. I, I know, but do I feel anything for Mark? No, no. But when I go to, this is at the Met, I think, right? Or was up for a while. It's not up right now, but, um, you know, when you go in there, I want to go see this painting every time I go. <laughs> Actually, but I'm, I'm, but I, I read, I'm I a weirdo. The photographs about this painting at the Met. And all I did was I had, I used a slow shutter speed and there were children in front of it. So I didn't want to record their faces, but I wanted to get the sense of there being person people in the space between me and the painting, this face yeah. and the sense of like, it's so simple, isn't it? But just the disconnect between what's in focus and the size of it. Is, is, is kind of, um, can be quite disconcerting. It can yeah, be yeah. Yeah, so I mean, and you go up and you look at like individual hairs in his monobrow and stuff and you can actually, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, so this is Randy Dudley. This is actually, as I was saying to Sandy, this is about a mile from my house. So I could like walk there right now and go look at this scene. Mm. Um, in fact, when I had to go get COVID tests, I used to have to walk by this every time. Um, is there it, something of kindness in this way of recording these in-between spaces? Is there something of kind of like a, something humble or? Yeah, this, like, this would be a, un, like a forgotten, unremarkable place, except for the fact that it's, you know, what's interesting about this is that 
if you went there and painted it, it wouldn't look like really anything. If you went and photographed it, it wouldn't really look like anything. But somehow making a pencil drawing of a photograph of this relatively innocuous place suddenly gives it meaning that it didn't have before. Yeah, there's also, you know, there's a real, I feel like a sense of kind of legacy of history of something archival. Do you, th do you think part of it is, is the monochromatic yeah. element of it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the fact that he's, you know, I, as I recall, because I've, I've seen, I went to a show of, of this guy's work a few years ago. Um, as I recall, you know, they looked meticulous up close. You know, I mean, they were perfect. And you just think that's really somebody with something going on in their brain to like make this kind of stuff this way. Um, and just, the, but the, the tones and the edges of, 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 the, of the frame, as it were, you know, like it goes, it, it goes out to the edge, and they, as I recall, they weren't matted. Or even this one, you can see the mat is way further out. So the outer edge, there was no like overdrawing of the corners of anything. You know what I mean? Like everything was just sort of exactly how it is. I mean, there's some level of weird OCD to make something like this, right? This isn't just I'm going to take my time. This is you're obsessed to is be able to do this. Level. I mean, you've said already in the previous work. You know, there must be something almost like a savant in the ability yeah. to record in such a way. I mean, you know, someone like Stephen Wiltshire, who goes out in a helicopter and flies over Tokyo yeah. once, comes back. I was, I was about to bring that guy up, yeah. Uh, you know, recreates the entirety of the city in a, in a vast drawing after seeing it only once. You know, that, that is something that is superhuman. Yep. Really. Um, I understand why you would say that this is kind of obsessive. There's something uh, extraordinary and perhaps superhuman about these, but it's not the same thing. I'm wondering about sentimentality with these, particularly this work. This one is the one maybe that has a sentimentality to it that is, uh, I find it interesting. This to is, me or to you or to the artist, do you mean? Even to me, it plays, okay. on, it plays on my received notions about New York, about, about places that are um, overlooked or where what I think of as real history has kind of happened. Mm -hmm. um, it approaches meaning, this work, in a yeah. different to the others do you also think that maybe and I, I don't i don't know i remember talking to him for a minute but i don't know the answer to this question that there are certain people for whom i you know we keep we i use the term and you said it again obsession and sort of you imagine this person must be like really compulsive about this kind of thing but it may be that this is just how they see the world and there's no other way to do it. It's not an obsession. It's just sort of, maybe it's almost a, I need to do this as a state of relaxation. You know what I mean? Like this is how I see the world and me sitting there with a set of pencils drawing this is in its own way, uh, uh, my safe space kind of thing. You know what I mean? Which is why I'm puzzled that we treat this then, if that were true, yeah. we, this is fine art. We, this is fine art, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe just because the craft is so over the top that we can't imagine it being anything other than, you know? So, I, I mean, this is something, again, that could be really gone into very carefully, is when something is so incredible because of its craft, is the you know we have a bit of a disconnect don't we between things that are craft-based arts <laughs> yeah and things that we consider to be fine arts one has a definite sense of the elite and the loftiness that comes with high thinking whereas is this actually mindless this yeah. is simply recording yeah i mean with this actually as i said i think that there's actually much more meaning to do with memory and legacy and history yep. and uh, 
but but if but if we take our our point of maybe it is just sort of like his state of rest doing this yeah it, it, i think i think it's because you and i couldn't do it in a state of rest that we assume that it took 40 years of study in order to attain this level of accuracy kind of thing but there but there are people who go in freehand and you know draw a photorealistic version of a coke can sitting on a table without a photograph of it which i always find interesting because for you know we've looked at images for thousands of years and only in the last 40 years do people are able people able to make things that look so realistic that we can't tell them from a photograph well we talked before about paintings that are made that yeah, but even a Vermeer is, I mean, it looks, I mean, obviously Tim's Vermeer and all the rest of it proved that there was some like a, a, a camera-esque process to it, but they don't look like photographs. They still look like paintings. But that's because, yeah, I mean, that's why we talked as we did before, where we looked at paintings that look like photographs that look like paintings. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, all of this is starting to, uh, these, kind of incremental movements within the evolution of art are that you know they're happening happening all the time in this kind of drawing you know is there suddenly a collision between what we might think of as a more traditional sense of craft-based art making at the highest point of fine art well actually we could say that this has been loaded up with my memory projections of old photographs that one might find at a tabletop sale or a flea market yeah. of, of a dead world. Yeah, weirdly enough, there's with Dudley and the last guy, there's also there's a snapshot notion to it, but also a weird timelessness to it. Yeah. I mean, this one, this one could be considered to be quite gaudy. Yeah. Uh, and kitsch. I, I think um, these kinds of color work realism has a, a, an unfortunate propensity to tip into the kitsch uh, without meaning to. I, I agree. There's a guy who, uh, there's a Photoshop artist named Bert Monroy who also does this kind of stuff, but does it all with just shapes and gradients, things in four million layer Photoshop documents, you know? Mm -hmm. And he draws these things that when you back up, it looks photorealistic. And he went from nothing except for, you know, pen tools and, and, and fills in Photoshop. And you're like, I don't understand how that works either. You know, it's just a whole other level, you know? Um, I think the last one is, is in many ways, um, one of the more impressive ones, I think. Because this guy's doing them with pencils, not quite freehand, but pretty nuts. I mean, just the shading on African skin like that. Are you kidding me? That's nuts. So, this guy's Nigerian, right? Yeah. So he's in Lagos. He's, you know, you can read a lot about him. He's, um, I didn't say Stanley. Got a lot of press recently. Stanley, yeah. Uh, Igbengu, I think he goes mainly, but just by Arinze Stanley. Maybe Correct. That, that, maybe that dreadful fear of, um, you know, the, the, the West of... Being too African, not that kind of thing, yeah. Being able to say the word or sure. not, not understanding the name. Oh, it's a shame. Uh, yeah. But on his own website, he calls himself Arinze Stan, uh, Stanley. And he's got a really wonderful artist statement and um, very kind of informative. There's actually a lot to go on from his statement about his work. And mm -hmm. he sees his work as a, a kind of activism. Um, and this is pencil drawing. And just to be really clear, because we've been a bit lazy this season. It's just so nuts. It's nuts. It's acrylic as well. I think, yeah. you know, that this is yeah. painting. This is obviously drawing. This work is is pencil and charcoal on on cartridge paper. They're very big. Um, 
he's a young artist who was born in 1993. Uh, he lives in Nigeria. And though his most recent exhibition uh, was in LA, you know, he's not yet, who knows what will happen, but he's not yet been kind of seduced by the US. You know, he is Nigerian, he lives in Nigeria. He's also yep. self-taught, he's had no formal art training. Um, his education was in maybe in engineering or yeah. But, but obviously a savant of, of a kind. I mean, you do, this is not the kind of thing you self-teach yourself unless you have a propensity to doing it naturally. It's too good. Yes, and again, go to his website, have a look at his work. Um, it's being snapped up by anybody who's anybody. I think because there's a crossover of uh, you know, a kind of poignancy and something of, of the time, something of an urgency in yeah. particularly US culture. Yeah. That means I, by the way, I, ch I chose this one because this is the first one I saw of, of his, but a lot of the other ones, which are more, not composite but obviously have a more artistic slant with like body parts overlapping and people's hands coming around, faces and that kind of stuff. Um, obviously making all kinds of political statements as well, which as you were about to say, sorry. Well, yes, a lot of people read the, the shine on the skin as blood. Um, and actually it's not if, you know, he says himself, it's, it, it's meant to be oil. Mm -hmm. uh, Nigeria is the biggest producer of oil, crude, crude oil in- oh, Especially Africa. in the Delta by the water, yeah. Uh, but that even though there's this extraordinary natural resource, 40% of uh, Nigerians live in abject poverty. Yep. And because of the vast wealth possible through drilling for oil, the selling of oil, there's huge problems with corruption. Um, there's lots of very difficult things politically. Anyway, there's a description somewhere about this idea that he wanted to think about what it was like to have that oil on your on your skin, to be smeared in it. This kind of almost like you know suffocating, and thinking also yeah. about the, the people who work to have them are part of a production. Yeah, I'm just covered in the stuff all day long. Yeah, and it. He said here. Um, he says his work begs the question. What's the value of a human being? You know, I mean, very specifically, he was quoted as saying, you know, he wanted to question, you know, what did it mean to be a black man in 2020? But more broadly, what is the value of a human being? Um, and obviously in context, that is, what is, what is the value of, the machine man, the man who is in production, who perhaps does live in poverty, yet is a, a, a part in a giant chain that leads to so much wealth for so many others higher up a chain. Where, where is the cutoff between somebody who's valueless and somebody who's valuable in the eyes of the world or well, and who makes those decisions or is it just sort of a emergent property of smaller decisions made by individuals? Um, I, you know, he's got a zeal for per perfection. Um, again, I've taken this from the website, but uh, the thing that's driven him are the three P's, which for him are, uh, where have I written them? Patience, practice and persistence. That's what that's what's driven them. <laughs> and there's videos on there showing him doing the work and, and half finished pictures and stuff. It's it's really interesting to go. It's a great that's a good site to go look at. Yeah. Actually, all of the sites for all the people we're talking to about today are, are interesting reads. Well, I think though this is a this is a really good one for us to finish on. Mm. 
I like that we're talking about somebody who's really current. Um, yeah. But also, you know, unlike what I feel with the painting of Mark by Chuck Close, I'm arrested by this person in a very different way to the way I'm engaged by Mark. Now, yep. I haven't seen this in the flesh, though I know the drawings are very large. Um, but At least larger than life size, though not Mark sized, yeah. Yeah. I like the idea that um, Arinze Stanley is able to say that he wants to forge an intimate connection between the viewer and the story of this person. Whereas I, I get just kind of a hollow absence. Yeah. Well, you're also talking about 2019 versus the late seventies. I mean, talk about, like I said about the Chuck Close painting where it was a microcosm of very seventies feel mm. that also goes back to, you know, I think, I think the way that things in the seventies, like the way that art was represented in the seventies, it was sort of, he was going for sort of devoid of knowledge about Mark. It was just a face, especially for somebody who is face blind. Right. It's just like, he just, it, it, I think it's a, it's a different goal despite similar uh, uh, effect of, of the result. All well, these S's with these things in my mouth are driving me crazy. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it is, I mean, look, it's 40 years later, you know, literally 40 years later. Mm. Have you got a favorite out of these four, Bill? Um, I like the I like the two of people the most just because I take portraits. Um, this one is exceptional, but the Chuck Close has something in my heart just because I've seen it a bunch of times and the scale of it and the origins of the movement and all the rest of it, it has more meaning to me, you know. Um, but a lot of uh, Stanley's work are, are, are very artistically inventive in my opinion. Mm. I think they're really neat. And yeah, I mean, it is nice to be doing something about someone current, but isn't it interesting that like the current thing, there could have been some person in the seventies making very similar artwork to this. There's nothing, there's no revolution in this guy's stuff. It's that he's, you know, it's his little twist on it, but there's nothing stopping Chuck Close or one of his contemporaries from painting a black man with a stare like this. Similarly, would that mean different, something different if they weren't Nigerian, say, or if it was at a different time or, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot to it. And isn't it true of all of art? Yep. Exactly what you say. And it also depends, you know, the, the when I think is the biggest question there. You know, it's just, it's like the time period at which these things are done, they mean different things. Look at us, Sandy, banging out the episodes. <laughs> Got any final thoughts? Well, the final thought can't be a launch pad into another 10 minute segment of this. So oh, I, we can keep talking if you like. No, I would just say that actually, I'm not sure I agree that the when is the defining part of how we receive or interpret the symbols of what we see. Okay. This is really important. Um, an interesting selection for me because it sort of conceptually and contextually isn't any of it the kind of work that I would normally invest in, though I enjoy looking. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the two black and white images for me are perhaps more meaningful 
and there's an irony in that because I love color. Yeah, it's it's uh, they're more meaningful even though they're giving you less information. Because mm. you like space. Maybe it's that with photorealism, there's so little. There's much less space for structural interpretation. You know, like you're you're you're. This is a person. There's no question of whether it's a person and what he's saying and like what he's looking at or whatever. That by removing the color. It, that gives your room, your brain room to fill the color, right? You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's less information, which gives more room for interpretation, which you found in the black and white image of Smith and Ninth Street to allow this sort of nostalgic quality and timelessness that it wouldn't have had if it was in color. Bill Woodman, it appears you've just explained me away. I, I'm not explaining it away. I'm just giving a plausible explanation. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. Goodbye, Sandy. <laughs>